Phil to Mission Control. Come in, Mission Control. Psh, uh, this is Mission Control, Phil. Uh, we read you loud and clear. Psh, I would... Oh. Greeting! Greeting, science! Greeting, science! Greeting, Science Maximites! Welcome to Science Max Experiments at Large. My name is Phil McCordick, and today we're gonna be building an air-powered rocket. Too difficult, you say? Nonsense, it's easy. It's not like it's rocket science. Hey, it is rocket science. Cool! Here's what you need. You need a bottle and a cork. Make sure that the cork fits nicely into the bottle, and then you need an air pump, because you can't have an air-powered rocket without air. And on this air pump, you need a pin, the special kind that you use to inflate basketballs or volleyballs or stuff like that. Now, what you want to do is push the pin through the cork. You might want an adult's help for this. Push it through until it goes through on the other side, and then make sure you get a good seal with the bottle. Now you're ready to launch your rocket with air pressure. But first, let's do a few other things. Take your cork and put it in a tripod launcher. You can make this out of pencils or anything you want, as long as it stands up nice and solidly. And then, of course, you want to decorate your bottle so it looks like a rocket. This is my rocket. Pretty good, right? So stick the bottle on the cork like before, like that. And then you stick the pin in the bottom. And what we're going to do is we're going to inflate the bottle with air pressure, and then it's gonna launch. Okay, here we go. Uh, you know, rocketry really isn't something you should do indoors. Come on. This will do nicely. <laughs> now, don't forget to do this with an adult and don't forget your safety glasses. Now set up the rocket in a nice big open area and make sure it's pointed away from you. And then what you do is you pump the air pump and it puts air into the rocket, which pushes down on the water, which will push down on the cork until eventually <laughs> so, be Science Maximites and come up with your own rocket design. Try different amounts of water, different fins, even a different size bottle. Try it for yourself and see if you can get one that goes higher than mine just did. How did I get in? I think it was this way. Today, we're going to be experimenting with the Drag Racer. Huh? Pretty cool. It works like this. You pull the string and get the wheels going really fast, and then you let it go and it just drives away on its own. The interesting thing is that I don't have to push it, it goes by itself. It all has to do with Newton's first law of motion, which is an object at rest tends to stay at rest, and an object in motion tends to stay in motion. Uh, yeah. Let's get building. Here is everything you need to build your very own dragster. You need some popsicle sticks, some straws, and some shish kebab skewers. I love these. You can get these at the grocery store. Uh, let's see, some elastics. And of course, you want wheels. And I just cut my wheels out of cardboard. So here's a quick explanation of how to build your dragster. First, use anything round to trace three circles out on your piece of cardboard. Remember, you want two big and one small circle. Then cut out your wheels. Then it's time to make the frame of the dragster using popsicle sticks and elastics. Just put two popsicle sticks together, then wrap the elastic band around them to keep them together. First you build one side, then the other side. Then add some pieces across the middle to give it support. Remember not to put any popsicle sticks too near the ends because they'll get in the way of your wheels. Next, cut the straws into small pieces and use an elastic band to tie them to the ends of the popsicle sticks. Then it's just a matter of sticking the shish kebab skewer in a wheel, passing it through the straws, and sticking on the other wheel. Don't forget that the small wheel goes in the middle at the front. You can trim the skewers afterward by just breaking it off short. If you want step-by-step -step directions on exactly how to do this, you can go to our website. It's all right there. 
Now the last part is wrap some string around the back axle so you can pull and the wheels will spin. Let's check it out and see how it works. Didn't work that well, did it? That's because we haven't added the secret ingredient. Plasticine, the perfect secret ingredient for all of your dragster needs. And also sculpting, because that's what it's for. Remember how I said an object at rest tends to stay at rest and an object in motion tends to stay in motion? Well, the heavier something is, the more force you need to change its direction, either get it moving or make it stop. That is called inertia. It's the tendency for an object to resist the change in motion, either getting it going or making it stop. So, the heavier we make the wheels of our dragster, the more they will resist a change in motion. So what I've done is I've stretched out my plasticine, and then you roll the wheels of the dragster around in the plasticine, and this will make each wheel way heavier than just the cardboard by itself. And it will make it much better in terms of keeping the dragster going, because if the wheel has more weight, it will have more inertia. Now, I have to wrap the string around the back axle, just like that, and there we go. All right, let's try it out. All right, let's give it a shot and see how it works. Pull on the string, get the wheels going real fast, and there it goes. And behold the power of states of matter. Greetings, science maximites. <coughs> I'm Phil McCordick. <coughs> I think I overdid it with the fog machine. <sighs> this is Science Max, experiments at large. Can you even see me? Let's, let's go over here. Today we're talking about states of matter. Now there are three main states of matter, solid, like this table, liquid, like the water in this beaker, and gas. Yes, thank you. And we're also gonna be looking at the things that kinda go in between, things that are sometimes solid, sometimes liquid, like cornstarch mud, which is very easy to make. All you need is water and cornstarch, which you can get at the grocery store. Mix it up however much you want. Just remember, two parts cornstarch to one part water. Twice as much of this, then you have of that. Very easy, mix it up, and you get cornstarch mud, which sort of seems like a liquid unless you hit it. And then it becomes solid. But if I pour it, it's a liquid. Even if I hold it in my hand and I hit it really fast, it turns into a ball, and it will stay in a ball as long as I keep hitting it or squeezing it, but as soon as I stop, it turns into a liquid again. Reading Science Maximites, today we're going to be looking at air. I know, it's, it's kind of hard to look at air because it's, well, it's invisible. But we can look at something that uses air to move. That's right, paper airplanes! Ha ha! Ha ha! Look out! Woohoo! Believe it or not, you can learn all kinds of science from paper Airplanes, so let's build some. We are going to do a paper airplane which actually holds the Guinness World Record for the longest paper airplane flight. Pretty cool, huh? First, you fold the paper in half like this, but then you open it back up again, and then you fold in the corners like this. Now, don't worry if this is really, really fast because you have all the instructions on our website. Then you can fold the paper down like this, make sure it's about two centimeters from the bottom where the point is there, and then you fold the corners in just like you did before. But these ones are just guide folds. We use guide folds to help us fold other folds, basically. Now we fold again using the guide fold lines you just made. And I like to call this fold the shirt collar fold because it sort of looks like a shirt collar when you fold it. Now we fold again on the fold that you made before. Folds in like that and in like that. And now we fold the point down to touch the edges right like that. And this is a guide fold, so do it very strong. Unfold it. Now you fold it in half like this. And see that guide fold line that we made there? What you're gonna do is you're gonna take the tip and you're gonna fold it in to touch the guide fold line like that. And this is also a guide. And open it up 
And here's the trickiest part. See how it's bent like that? Push it open like this. And this is called a pocket fold because you want to make a little pocket and push it up against there. Fold it flat like this. Fold this tip down over there like that. Then fold it around the back side. Then fold the wings down like this and like this. And here's the extra special bit. We're going to use some stabilizers on this plane. Fold up the stabilizers on the ends of the wings, and ta-da, the Sky King paper airplane fold. Now, as science maximites, you know that there's lots of ways you can learn how to fold paper airplanes. Get an adult and look up paper airplane designs on the internet, or take a book out of the library on how to fold paper airplanes. Greetings, science maximites. Today, we're gonna be talking about, whoa, balance, or what you call balance in science, which is center of gravity. Now, the center of gravity is a place you can find in any object where it's equally balanced on all sides. I balance this spoon on the eraser of this pencil, and where the spoon is balancing is its center of gravity. But if I take this little tiny dime and put it in the spoon, it doesn't balance anymore. But if I put the dime in this spoon and balance it in a different spot, I can find the new center of gravity, and the spoon balances again. Here's another experiment you can do. Take a potato and a ruler or a stick. Try to balance the potato on the ruler. I'm gonna save us both a lot of time. It's really hard to do. The potato does have a center of gravity, but because of its shape, it's going to be really hard to find and really hard to balance. But if you take some forks and you stick them into the potato, you're no longer just trying to balance the potato, you have to balance the forks and the potato and it gives it a very different center of gravity, which makes it a little bit easier to find and a little bit easier to balance. Ha <laughs> ha! Whoa! Let's take a closer look at how the center of gravity works using our potato. No, that's too close. Back off a little bit. Okay, good. If you want to find where the center of gravity is, you can hang an object and draw a line straight down. Then hang it from a different spot and draw another line. Do this one or two more times, and you can see where the lines meet is the center of gravity. If our potato was balanced on a stick, the center of gravity is a long way from the stick, so it's going to be pretty hard to balance. Now, let's stick some forks in the potato and try again. One line there, a line there, and a line there, and you can see that the lines all come together down here. That's right, the center of gravity doesn't have to be on the object. With the center of gravity way down there, when we try to balance the potato and the forks on the stick, you can see the center of gravity is much closer to the stick. That makes it way easier to balance. Now, because you're science maximites, I'm sure you know that a potato and forks is just the beginning. Everything you have in your house has a center of gravity, which means Theoretically, you can balance anything. Try it yourself. Find things around the house and see if you can get them to balance. And if you can't, try adding things to increase the center of gravity and make it a little bit easier. Okay. Uh, where were we? Oh yeah, levers. So you can use levers to become much stronger or at least lift something you couldn't normally lift. Levers are simple machines and they work like this. Levers are just a long rod or a stick or pole or a piece of wood like I've got here and something for them to pivot on, a fulcrum. Now let's say you have something heavy, like this book. Sure, I can lift it, but what if I told you I can lift this heavy book with this book? Now if the fulcrum is in the middle, like a seesaw, you can tell that book is much heavier than the other book. But watch what happens when I move the fulcrum. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Huh? It's like magic, but it's not magic. It's science. Whoa. It's because the small weight is moving a long distance and the heavy weight is moving a short distance. Small weight, long distance, heavy weight, short distance. So everything balances out. But here's where it gets interesting. The longer your lever, the more weight you can lift. These are two heavy cinder blocks. There's the fulcrum, and here is a very long lever with which I am going to lift those cinder blocks with this book. Ha 
<laughs> and there you have it, levers. <sighs> okay, rollers. Rollers are like wheels, except they're not attached to anything. In ancient times, they used to move giant, heavy blocks of stone using rollers. We can demonstrate using a book. Now get a book, put it on a table, and try to move it across the table. You'll see that it's very difficult. I can't move this book across the table. I can't. OK, it's not really that hard. But still, it takes effort. But if we get some rollers, I like to use pencil crayons and not pencils. And here's why. Take a closer look. You see, pencils aren't round, they're hexagonal. They have six sides, whereas pencil crayons are round. And of course, if you want something to roll, you want something round. So get a bunch of pencil crayons and put them on the table and put the book on the pencil crayons. And you'll see that suddenly, moving it is a lot easier. Pulleys. Pulleys are a great way to change the direction of force. I've got a rope going through this pulley and down to a book. So when I pull the rope down, the book goes up. Changing the direction of force can be very helpful, but pulleys can be helpful in another way. Pulleys can let you lift something that you couldn't normally lift. Now the rope goes up and down and up and down and up and down. And the force I need to lift this cinder block is a lot less than if I was just lifting it by myself. But I've got to pull a lot more rope. That's called mechanical advantage. Spreading out the force over a longer pull so you can lift a larger weight. If you use more pulleys, it reduces the amount of force. One pulley, same amount. Two pulleys, half the force. Three pulleys, one third. So I've got five pulleys here, which means I only need one fifth the force to lift this cinder block. So there you go, pulleys. Oh. Oh. Okay. OK, ramps. Ramps are a great way to move something up. I will demonstrate using, you guessed it, a book. Let's say I wanted to move this heavy book on top of this stack of books using just this little string. Watch what happens. The string breaks. But if I built a ramp to get the book on top of this stack, and I use the same kind of string, watch what happens this time. Oh. You see, the ramp distributes the force, so you use less force to pull the book over a, the same amount of distance, and I can get it up to the top of st the stack of books, and the string doesn't break. So ramps. <laughs>